Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Asha Sundaram, and I'm a senior lecturer uh, in economics at the University of Auckland. I'm usually nervous about coming in between people and their lunch, uh, but not today, because I think this is going to be a fascinating session. Uh, so we're in a world where labels like made in New Zealand or made in China don't really mean much. And we cannot talk about international trade without talking about the fragmentation of production activity across borders. And who better to talk to us about this than our next speaker for the day, uh, Professor Fukunari Kimura. Uh, Professor Kimura obtained his PhD uh, in economics from the University of Wisconsin at Madison. He is the professor of economics at uh, Kyo University in Japan, and he is also chief economist of the, uh, at the Economic Research Institute for ASEAN and East Asia. Uh, in addition to being a keen rugby fan, uh, Professor Kimura uh, is internationally known for his research and his thought leadership on uh, production networks, the digital economy, particularly in East Asia, and not only in the academia, but also in global trade policy circles. So I believe that his diversity of experience will be particularly appreciated by this audience. So please keep the questions coming. Uh, and Professor Kimura, we're very happy that you're here and we look forward to your presentation. Thank you very much for a very generous introduction. Uh, first, I'd like to, uh, I'd like to thank uh, organizers for giving me an opportunity to participate in this uh, very meaningful meeting. Uh, I have two hats, as I introduced. Uh, actually, I'm a bit more than half of the days a year I'm teaching at uh, Keio University, Tokyo. Uh, still uh, teaching pretty boring, uh, very traditional uh, trade theory and other things. Sometimes I'm still teaching a Heckscher-Oli model, of course. Uh, but uh, uh, the rest, actually, I'm flying around uh, Asia, particularly ASEAN, and then thinking of uh, how uh, we can think of uh, development strategies of uh, developing countries. Uh, we heard of uh, the China story. Uh, China is a great country. Uh, but in many aspects, uh, not, a, not an usual developing country in terms of, uh, say, human capital, uh, political system, and the size, of course. Uh, but if you look at the ASEAN, then we have many common elements uh, common to uh, the general developing countries. So, so in those kind of, uh, I would say, uh, quote-unquote, usual developing countries, how we can think of development strategies. I think this is a very important topic that uh, I'm, I'm working on. So, so from that viewpoint, uh, how now the digital technologies is coming into developing countries in a really full scale, uh, probably m much more than uh, the u people in uh, developed countries would expect. So then really they are thinking of how they can adjust development strategies. So in the past 30 years, uh, we, we were in uh, the second unbundling world, and we, particularly in ASEAN and the surrounding East Asia, are uh, utilizing the mechanism, mechanism of uh, that sort of uh, international division of labor. Uh, but now uh, technology is coming in and how we can, we should adjust those kind of uh, division of labor, and also a new type of division of labor, that could be the third unbundling, uh, could be uh, the service outsourcing, uh, would come in, and how they can prepare for those uh, changes. So I think those are very extremely important uh, topic right now for ASEAN and probably in other developing countries too. So that's what I'd like to talk about today. Um, so the background is that the East Asia has led the development of international production networks or the second unbundling, uh, particularly in the machinery industry. That's a champion of utilizing this kind of division of labor. I'm not talking about government, not talking about footwear. So some part of those industries are doing this kind of division of labor, but usually it's a much slow type 
international division of labor. But going into machinery industries, uh, we, we really observe the, the back and forth transactions of parts and components, and those should be very timely and synchronized manner. Otherwise, uh, this kind of division of labor doesn't work. So, so that's uh, what we did in uh, ASEAN and East Asia. So, uh, by the way, so if I say East Asia, then actually, actually this is ASEAN plus three sometimes, or sometimes ASEAN plus six. Okay. So, so that's East Asia. And then now we have two challenges. Uh, one is the globalization and or anti-globalization. We heard of the story a lot already. Uh, the other is digital technology. So then, then how to reformulate the development strategies in uh, newly developed and developing countries. Uh, the two issues exist here. One is that we have manufacturing uh, production networks. How should we readjust uh, those kind of division of labor? So that's one thing. The other thing is uh, we are facing a new frontier in services with the communication technology. So those are related but probably quite different uh, problems, probably. So, so I will talk about the first one and the second one. Uh, so the two challenges are a bit more in detail. Uh, one is uh, the globalization and the anti-globalization. Uh, so as a world overall trend in technology, uh, we observe a reduction in transport costs, uh, and then that's really enhancing mobility. So that's a sort of really global trend in the technology. Uh, re regardless of the policies, we observe that. So, uh, so transport costs of what? Actually, so we are observing uh, much more details, so starting from goods, uh, the services are much more mobile, and then uh, so certainly capital, technology, people, but really in general, we are having a much more wider scope of uh, mobility. Uh, that, but at the same time, so we, are, we observe a rising uh, protectionism. And then uh, Richard Bolden said that uh, trade war is a uh, uh, negative economic integration. So in economic integration, uh, from the viewpoint of the third country, we could have a neg slightly negative uh, trade diversion effects. Uh, but now uh, that's the opposite. Uh, third countries may have slightly positive trade diversion effect. So that, that is observed in uh, Vietnam, Thailand, and other places right now. So some, uh, some trade and investment is uh, coming, uh, moving from China to some, some of the Southeast Asian countries, actually. Uh, but probably the, the enhancing uncertainty uh, would affect much more, so that is certainly negative, and then so that will affect a, a new investment, because in order to set up production networks, we need investment. We, we need a sort of long-term perspective to do that. So we are not really doing uh, so transactions at the spot market. So we are really having, uh, so the net, setting up networks in a really intentional manner. So, so uncertainty is really affecting negatively for those kind of uh, formation. So going to digital technology, uh, so the, the first book of uh, Richard is uh, talking about two phases of the same uh, technological paradigm. I think this is very useful uh, to think of uh, the impact of digital technology, particularly for developing countries. That's IT, information technology, and CT, uh, communication technology. Uh, so IT is, a say, robots, AI, machine learning, industry 4.0, that's a, a sort of image. Uh, the city, uh, say, internet, smartphones, 5G. Okay. Um, when we talk about the international division of labor, the impacts of those technology could be quite different. In case of uh, IT, uh, basically the number of uh, Basically, uh, say the data processing speed is getting faster, uh, so we do not need a sort of a too many steps for doing something. So the number of tasks may be reduced. So uh, then probably uh, we can have a sort of concentration forces coming in. Uh, we don't have to do a much division of labor. Uh, but in case of uh, communication technology, that is really overcoming distance. 
So, so possibly that will that would accelerate division of labor. So when we talk about, from the viewpoint of developing countries, how to attract some economic activities, uh, we really have to utilize those. But those two aspects of uh, digital technology may affect in the opposite direction. So that's uh, one thing that we have to start thinking of that. So how can they incorporate digital technology into development strategies? Uh, one is uh, talking about IT. Uh, any policy needed for introducing IT, uh, certainly developing countries are not at the frontier of uh, developing IT. They are uh, uh, basically the, the, the situation that they are users rather than a sort of re real developers for those kind of technology. Uh, so can we still push, uh, so say, cheap labor strategy and others, or sh should they really think of uh, the uh, possible introduction of IT in order to keep uh, production networks? Now, those are one thing that we really have to think of that. So certainly here then, we have substitutability and complementarity between machines and humans. So, so in, in the context of developed countries, uh, we are really thinking of uh, substitutability a lot. Uh, but actually, uh, uh, many new type of labor, new type of works are generated by that. So those are complementary, uh, complementarity between machines and humans. Uh, similar thing happens in the case of develop, developing countries, how they can seek some sort of a complementarity. That could be very important. And the, the city, actually, city is already there. If you go to Jakarta, Bangkok, everywhere, so, let alone China, uh, cities already there and really penetrating into their daily life. So uh, that's not because of the government policy. Uh, maybe I would say that the government policy is not doing anything, so that's why they are coming in already. So, uh, so then we have to think of uh, uh, the supporting soft and hard infrastructure, probably. That's uh, the story that we have to think of. So going to the manufacturing uh, link first, they're talking about the second uh, um, unbundling world. Uh, many people are, are saying that uh, this kind of division of labor is already gone, it's out of date. Uh, so that kind of argument is a lot in uh, ASEAN too, but I think this is really a, a sort of dangerous uh, argument. Uh, uh, still, I, I don't know how many years we would stand with this, but at least at the current status, still we have a lot of room for expanding and deepening uh, production networks in manufacturing sector. So no, don't, don't jump into a sort of no manufacturing world suddenly. Uh, still we can do, uh, that's what I like to claim. Uh, so, uh, so if we compare with other regions, uh, so in ASEAN and East Asia are utilizing this kind of mechanism a lot. But still, uh, the, the, the degree of participation in production networks uh, is so uneven within East Asia. Some countries are doing a lot, uh, say in case of uh, Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand. Uh, but in, uh, so in case of uh, uh, Indonesia, Vietnam, the Philippines, they are really connected uh, with outside, uh, but still uh, industrial agglomeration, that's a, that's a counterpart of uh, international division of labor. Uh, that is not really well developed yet. So they are really investing a lot in uh, the generating in industrial agglomeration. Uh, Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, still not really coming into the connection. So, so I think that the degree of participation is quite different across countries. Uh, so, and, and also, uh, some people say that in the slow trade era, uh, two th between 2011 and uh, 2016, uh, say global value change dead. Okay. Uh, I, I'd like to resist that belief. Uh, then actually, the parts and components trade in machinery in East Asia are not really slowing down. So, so growing, I will show uh, that even in that uh, period. Uh, footnote is, of course, I have to check what's going on in 2018, 19, 20, because uh, so, uh, so the overall uh, machinery production networks will be slowing down uh, together with the slowing down in Chinese economy. So, so that's a footnote, but up to the 1917, 18, I'm pretty sure that, that this kind of trade, this kind of international division of labor 
were still uh, developing, uh, growing uh, in East Asia. And, and also, so the manufacturing sector is uh, still at the core of development strategies in those countries. So we really seek the possibility of uh, enhancing uh, location advantages and the reduction in uh, service link costs. That was a really core part of uh, ASEAN integration and the East Asian economic integration. And also, uh, fragmentation of production, at the same time, the formation of agglomeration, particularly industrial agglomeration, that is a very important portion of the development strategies. Uh, then, so you can see uh, this, uh, put a lot of stress on so-called connectivity, that partially the physical connectivity like infrastructure, uh, physical infrastructure, and also the institutional infrastructure, those were at the core of uh, the development strategies. Uh, that, that kind of development is still important, uh, both uh, in economic term and also social term. If you see uh, the ASEAN and East Asia, we can see a very active uh, internal labor movements from rural to urban or suburban and also informal to formal. That the manufacturing sector and the surrounding uh, services sector generates a lot of jobs for relatively poor people. So, 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 so relatively poor people, say in case of Thailand, from northeast uh, Thailand, moving to central to get some jobs, and many are uh, in manufacturing sector or surrounding the services sector. Uh, that kind of internal movement, labor movement was very important in order to see uh, the poverty alleviation. Uh, this, uh, the, this region has been very successful and very quick in uh, poverty alleviation compared with other parts of the developing world. And also, uh, after forming industrial agglomeration, uh, then they can get technology transfer spread over by, uh, by participating in uh, production networks originally run by multinationals. Uh, before forming industrial agglomeration, say in case of export processing zone, 100% import, 100% export, no technology transfer. So, they, so local firms have to come into production networks, and then finally they can get technology transfer, technology spillover. So, so I think the formation of industrial agglomeration is extremely important here. And many countries are not doing that uh, outside of East Asia. And also uh, we, we observe the robustness against uh, disasters too. Uh, actually compared with uh, spot market type uh, transactions, uh, transactions inside production networks are much more resilient, uh, even if we have a sort of uh, shocks uh, from the demand side or supply side. Yeah, so I, I just show some pictures. Uh, this is a, a old theory, so-called fragmentation theory. Uh, the paper was in the 1990. In 1990, actually, it's a, they did not observe this kind of things empirically, I guess. Uh, but uh, I think uh, the idea is that we need the production blocks with uh, location advantages, uh, particularly for developing countries. Suddenly, the inexpensive labor is one of the strengths. Uh, sometimes, uh, say, uh, uh, good uh, logistics connection, like uh, Singapore, uh, those, those are the location advantages. And also, but, but if we look at production blocks in the remote areas, then we have to connect those production blocks. So in order to do that, we have to reduce the service link cost to connect to those production blocks. And the ASEAN and East Asia are doing a lot for the reduction in service link cost. And also uh, some location advantages like, uh, uh, say, industrial estates, uh, so the basic uh, uh, economic infrastructure to support manufacturing, uh, they did a lot for those kind of things. So th then they can jump into so this kind of division of labor. Uh, this is too small, sorry, but uh, uh, so if you look at uh, the proportion of machinery exports and imports out of total exports and imports uh, for all countries, uh, uh, the red bar is uh, export side, blue bar is import side. In the 1970 or uh, 80, actually that kind of trade was very minimal. The stri stripe portion is parts and components, actually. So, so very small amount of uh, parts and components transactions, and also in, that's uh, basically one way. Uh, but in the seven, 1990, uh, 
2000, 2010, you can see a very large portion of stripe portion, and both export side and import side. Uh, this is really indication of uh, second unbundling in the machinery industries. They are really doing some uh, production process by importing parts and components, and then export again. So, so that's, uh, that's not a, the division of labor, industry by industry, but the one industry is really fragmented into the production processes, and then division of labor. So that's what we observe that. Uh, but if you look at uh, the countries, and uh, we have a lot of variety. On the left-hand side, uh, say uh, a lot of parts and components trade, Singapore, Philippines, Costa Rica, Hong Kong, Malaysia, Thai, Korea. Uh, so they're really doing second unbundling in the machinery industry. But the left, right-hand side, say you can see still as the really one direction, uh, one direction trade. They are just importing uh, machinery. Uh, but not really exporting. So, so even in the Laos, Myanmar, Cambodia, you can see uh, it's a still very minimal amount of uh, exports of machinery, machinery parts and components. So the Indonesia, Vietnam still uh, at the border. Uh, they're coming into uh, the second unbundling. Um, th this is in terms of the number of uh, parts and components, so-called ex uh, extensive margin. And the left-hand side, actually, uh, this is just counting the number of uh, exported machinery parts and components. Uh, in this classification, HS six digit, we have four, 443 kinds of machinery parts. And out of that, how many are exported? Uh, that's on uh, the horizontal line. Vertical line, uh, the number of uh, destinations, uh, number of uh, destination countries. Uh, they say Indonesia, Malaysia, uh, Singapore, Thailand, they are actually uh, exporting uh, almost all kinds of parts and components to somewhere. Uh, but in case of the Philippines, a little bit shorter in the horizontal line. So, so still really not fully coming into that in the sense. Uh, they're going to uh, Brunei, Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar. Uh, still very small number of small kinds, number of kinds of uh, parts are uh, exported. Uh, the Vietnam is really uh, changing a lot. Uh, the blue is at uh, 2007, the red is at 2013. You can see also really uh, ch ch big change in the, the involvement of uh, 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 production networks. Uh, so the, the next step is uh, forming industrial agglomeration not just doing uh, simplistic uh, so-called cross-border production sharing, that's a uh, left-hand side. Uh, they're coming into, uh, say, uh, electronics, uh, industrial agglomeration in the Malaysia and the Philippines. Uh, they can see the in uh, this kind of a division of labor, actually one company is uh, sharing as uh, short distance transactions and long distance transactions. It's not a really simplistic snake type shape or a simplistic spider shape, but it's a really a combination of short distance transactions and long distance transactions. The short distance transactions are done in industrial agglomeration. And in the case of automobiles, in the uh, right, right hand side, uh, much more uh, s s that kind of aspect is more salient. Uh, so they, they really prefer, uh, uh, compared with uh, uh, electronics, uh, they prefer industrial agglomeration. But still in uh, production in uh, automobiles in Thailand or Indonesia, they have to import some important parts from outside. That, that is really supporting industrial agglomeration. So by, say, in case of uh, Bangkok metropolitan area, uh, the, the circle is 100, 100 meter uh, diameter. Uh, they have uh, about 40 industrial estates. Uh, then they're doing a really just-in-time system. They have a very good uh, road network and also big ports and uh, airports. Uh, you, the Bangkok itself is very famous for traffic jam, but the outside, actually, that, that's very efficient. They are having so-called just-in-time system. Uh, say, in case of Toyota factory, they are doing a two-hour just-in-time system. So most of the parts, they are having only two-hour equivalent amount. So that means that at least once in two hours, 
uh, we, they have a supply of parts and components. That reduces the inventory stock of uh, parts and components. That, that saves uh, space and other things. At, at the same time, they are checking uh, the quality, uh, uh, ch checking quality, so, uh, say, coming, coming for coming in uh, parts and components very frequently. So that, that would uh, save time a lot and uh, uh, in just-in-time system. Uh, so th this is a nightlight picture. So the red portion is a very bright at night and the uh, green portion a little bit uh, darker, uh, white completely dark. Uh, uh, the, uh, from 1992 to 2012, you can see a sort of a uh, development of uh, industrial estates. The circle is now 136 kilometer diameter, actually. Uh, so, so the Bangkok metropolitan area is actually very efficient uh, in terms of uh, industrial estates, uh, industrial agglomeration. Uh, this is Jakarta. Uh, it's much more crowded, actually, and particularly on the uh, east side, le east side arm, uh, that's an important industrial uh, area. Uh, but uh, still pretty crowded. Now, I think, uh, but after this, uh, Indonesian government is really investing on uh, the formation of industrial agglomeration. So the highway system is expanded, uh, and, and also now a new port uh, construction is planned. Uh, urban transport is uh, really under construction. So, so they, we, we, they really have to have some efficient industrial agglomeration. So far, pretty inefficient. Uh, say uh, only 40 kilometers from the port to the, the factory, uh, they can just have one, one uh, round, round trip rather than a kind of frequent trip actually. But they are trying to improve that kind of situation. So, so the similar thing happens in the Philippines and the Vietnam right now. So, so they still have a lot of room for expanding this kind of operations. So uh, after having an industrial agglomeration, uh, how local firms can get technological information. If we look at an ASEAN's case, uh, we did a lot of uh, so questionnaire survey. Uh, say in case of uh, Japan, Korea, or Taiwan in the past, in the 1960s and 70s, uh, the functions of uh, universities, research institutes are very important. And also local firms are importing technology directly from foreign countries. Uh, but actually, uh, in ASEAN, those channels are relatively thin, but a very large uh, channel is uh, uh, buyers, uh, those are multinationals. Multinationals are employing uh, suppliers, or those are sometimes uh, local firms. Then we can see a lot of technology flow from uh, downstream to upstream. Uh, then, uh, then upstream firms are actually providing technology to another upstream firms. So th those are uh, what's going on uh, in industrial agglomeration. So you can see uh, the speed of uh, poverty alleviation. Uh, this, the color shows us uh, the, the, the income level uh, at the household level. Uh, then the basically the lower portion, uh, uh, light, light blue and uh, uh, red portion, uh, those are uh, poor people under poverty line. Uh, the, the proportion of those people are really uh, coming down uh, for all countries except the Philippines, actually. Uh, somehow, Philippines is very flat, uh, but in other countries, uh, very uh, quickly, uh, we, we observe uh, the poverty alleviation. Uh, it doesn't happen in many countries outside, say, African countries and others. It's not really uh, doing like this, actually. So, uh, but so the, the employment generation, uh, particularly for uh, so poor people, I think that was a very important aspect in this region. Uh, growth of trade uh, in the slow trade era, uh, you can see in uh, intra-East Asian trade, uh, say, uh, parts and components, and also consumption goods, those are basically finished products, including uh, machinery. Uh, those are growing even after 2011. So the speed of uh, growth is uh, a bit slower than in the mid-2000s, mid uh, but uh, so you can see in the really going up and going down, those are primary goods and also inter, uh, inter, uh, processed goods, those are basically uh, the materials. Uh, those are coming up and coming down. This is, by the way, in terms of uh, nominal prices. Uh, so, 
that we can see that the price, price cut of uh, primary products in this uh, region too. So if we make it uh, real, then maybe up and downs are much smaller. But uh, so most of the slow trade is coming from uh, slowing down of trade in uh, raw materials and also uh, uh, raw materials, actually, the primary goods. So uh, in the other parts of the, the, of the world, actually, it's not very uh, uh, clear. So, but inside East Asia, still up to 2016 at least, uh, so, uh, network-related trade is, uh, st was still growing, actually. So, so don't, don't lose the hope that we can, we can still use that. Okay. So then, then uh, I have to talk about the technology. So how to keep and activate production blocks in uh, less developed countries. So now, now we, have, we are talking about the fear of reshoring. Uh, reshoring is that in developing, developed countries, uh, we observe a substitution of labor by machines very quickly. Uh, that will come probably very quickly in a, in a few years. Uh, so cheap labor in LDCs may not be needed anymore. So if a labor is substituted by machines, uh, so the production blocks right now located in LDCs may come back to uh, developed countries possibly. So that is so-called reshoring. So, so, so shifting from offshore to onshore from the viewpoint of uh, developed countries. Uh, so many ASEAN countries are worrying about these kind of things. Uh, then, uh, but, but probably the substitutability uh, between uh, machines and labor uh, is not so simple. Uh, so largely, of course, we, we will see that the manual routine works could be replaced by machine faster compared with a cognitive, multitask, human uh, works. Uh, but the actual substitution occurs probably on a very uh, micro individual level. So we cannot really say that this type of labor is really wholly uh, replaced. And also, if you look at the production blocks, uh, a factory uh, right now located in LDCs, actually they're having a pretty complicated combination of uh, various inputs, not just a simple labor only, uh, but they are using various kinds of human capital and at the same time some local inputs too. So we could see uh, some sort of uh, uh, so complementarity over there too. Uh, and also the cost of introducing robots, uh, we just assume that uh, that kind of uh, cost would be much higher in developed con developing countries than in developed countries. Uh, but that may not be true because, say, uh, we do not buy local, local robots in uh, Jakarta, probably. So, so multinationals may import uh, those kind of uh, robots uh, from outside. So, so the cost of introducing robots may not be much more expensive than in LDCs compared with in the DCs. And also, the whole operation of this kind of manufacturing activities uh, will become more machine intensive, robot intensive. So, so you know that to, from the viewpoint of developing countries, how to keep those production blocks and stay in the production uh, networks, uh, they may think of uh, the introduction of machine a little bit more. Uh, that, that could be a sort of one possibility. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm working on, uh, with my co uh, to for some very, very simplistic uh, empirical study now. So we have the, the data of uh, industrial robot I introduction. This is a by industry, by country, by year data. Uh, put that on the right hand side and left hand side, it's a network trade. So basically, machinery parts and components of finished products. If you see uh, this uh, gravity exercise, actually, uh, the introduction of robots uh, on the side of uh, developing countries uh, positively affected uh, the network trade. Uh, and to, particularly with uh, the larger usage of uh, cross-border service outsourcing. This is actually the, the country level. And that happens only in East Asia somehow. The rest of the whole world, it doesn't work. So, so I think that's a possibility that uh, say uh, introduction of robots could be complementary 
to keep those uh, production blocks in developed con developing countries. Of course, uh, we cannot really conclude that very uh, easily because uh, the introduction of robots is uh, still in a very preliminary stage. Uh, so we would see much more big uh, movements in the coming years. But, uh, but at least we can say that the usage of IT uh, should not be excluded from the beginning. Uh, we, we should not say that, oh, you are developing countries, uh, so forget about the introduction of robots. Uh, that, that may not be a really good idea for going. going. So, so th this is a picture. So uh, we, are, we are using uh, labor, labor. So that's why production blocks are coming into developed country, developing countries. But uh, in develop, developed countries, uh, they are introducing robots. Uh, then that could be a cheaper way to do rather than have, using a, a cheap labor in the developing countries. So that's a reassuring story. Uh, but one possibility is that uh, introduction of robots uh, on the side of uh, developing countries, uh, that may be a sort of supplementary move to keep uh, those production blocks. And you can see that the whole industries are going to be more robot intensive. So it may be natural to make this kind of adjustment possibly. So, so at least we have to, we do not have to exclude this kind of possibility in the case of uh, developing countries. Okay, they're going to uh, the communications technology side, particularly in, this, uh, in the form of services. Uh, uh, so, so CT penetration is very fast in the LDCs, much faster than uh, what people in developed countries imagine. Uh, the reason is that they are young first, in general, uh, particularly compared with Japan, uh, compared with me, uh, they are so young. And also, uh, very lenient regulatory framework compared with the developed countries. The, so, so that is much easier to introduce those kind of technology and then set up new businesses. And also, weaker vested interest. So there's no big uh, union of taxi drivers and others. Okay. So, so I think uh, those uh, conditions accelerate the introduction of a city, uh, and then we can see a new business is a mushrooming there too. So starting from social media, uh, B2B, B2C, e-commerce. Uh, by the way, the B2B e-commerce is still much, bit, much bigger than B2C, uh, but the B2C is also growing. Uh, then matching and sharing, uh, say in uh, transportation or lodging, uh, service outsourcing, uh, gradually, uh, then e-payment, fintech, it depends on the country, but uh, so those are really coming in very fast. Uh, so, the, and, and at the same time, usage of uh, IT and CT in traditional industries, uh, that po portion is very, very important too. Agriculture, fishery, uh, farmers now have internet connection. They can do many things, uh, say, starting from weather forecast, uh, then it's so checking the prices of uh, their products in the market. Uh, they're really utilizing those kind of technologies. And so if it's more advanced uh, by using AI, uh, they can save pesticides by searching uh, sort of bugs, uh, by using a drone, for example. Uh, so they, they have a lot of uh, uh, perspectives for doing that. Uh, cottage industries, they can display their products in an uh, e-commerce site much at a very low cost uh, compared with the traditional way. And then transport, uh, catering, uh, lodging, uh, they, you can see a sort of matching uh, sites are uh, really flourishing. Uh, finance and also the governments. This is another very important thing. So governments are very inefficient in, in general in developing countries, but introducing those kind of technologies, they can do many things. Uh, then going to cross-border service outsourcing, that, that is uh, what Richard is talking about in the second book. Uh, second book is uh, particularly from the viewpoint of developed countries, but from the viewpoint of developing countries, how we can capture that kind of uh, division of labor. This is going to be a very important, uh, uh, important topic for them. Uh, th this is uh, uh, from uh, the first book of uh, Richard Baldwin. I, I think that this is my, uh, my, my simplistic interpretation of uh, his writing. Uh, but, so, so moving up to the second unbundling, we know what's going on very well. The third unbundling still, uh, it's not really in a full scale, uh, but uh, we, we will see we have to prepare for uh, the th third unbundling stage. Uh, 
So, so moving from a machinery industries to digital economy, so what we can do, and we, that's what we have to think of. Uh, so the matching course itself, uh, so the, uh, we, would, we had a really traditional shop, sari sari store at the corner of village or a uh, shopping mall. Uh, say, uh, both uh, seller side and buyer side, fixed cost was very high. So we had to go there to buy that. Uh, but uh, the internet platform, uh, actually the fixed cost of uh, displaying uh, products and also uh, searching products, those are going to be very uh, small. So, so I think that generates a lot of uh, uh, new businesses. Uh, the third unbundling could be like this, uh, say the individuals could be in uh, different areas, uh, then uh, we have the cloud uh, so memory over there. Uh, that, that could be uh, sort of major, uh, one of the major uh, international division of labor possibly. Yeah, so so the jump into uh, the new development strategies, I'm running time, uh, running out of time, but uh, I think the ASEAN and developing Asia are now really facing uh, new opportunities for utilizing uh, new technologies. Uh, so uh, we could do a sort of step-by-step, -step, uh, first unbundling, second and third. Uh, that could be very important, but uh, we may have some sort of a sudden jump, uh, say leapfrogging. So even if uh, no industrialization or no machinery industries, they may jump into, say, software outsourcing, those kind of things. And also utilizing uh, new technologies in the traditional industries, so that is uh, I call the feedback. Uh, those are also important. Those should be incorporated uh, into uh, their development strategies. Uh, so, right. So, so up to the second unbundling, uh, we knew that what we should do, uh, say, uh, so in economic integration and also forming industrial agglomeration coming into production networks. Uh, but in the third unbundling, uh, probably uh, we need more on consumer-oriented, people-oriented approach uh, in, uh, in economic integration and also uh, as a physical infrastructure. In the physical infrastructure, particularly uh, the urban amenities to attract good people, uh, we will have this kind of competition among countries and also cities. And so the urban amenities are going to be more important. So we would have much more a consumer-centered approach for various kinds of policies. So, so probably the policies could be slightly different in terms of uh, IT utilization and CT. And particularly on the CT side, uh, data movement is going to be very important. Uh, so this is actually it's in the policy brief of uh, T20 this year. Uh, if we put uh, the free flow of data at the center as a default, uh, so because we think much of uh, the net users' uh, op opportunities, uh, then we would have a bunch of policies to take care of that. In many uh, developing countries still, uh, data-related policies are very immature. They really have to introduce those kind of things in a system systematic manner. And this is one way to do. Uh, so the, the problem is that uh, even in developed countries now, uh, particularly in the red portion, competition policy, pri privacy issues, cybersecurity, taxation and others, we still do not have any uh, very clear consensus for those kind of uh, policies. But at least we have to have some sort of system, systematic approach to make a judgment that this policy is for this policy purposes and this is an appropriate one or not. So in order to do that, we need a sort of classification of policies. So conclusion, uh, facing two challenges, uh, ASEAN and developing East Asia must reformulate their development strategies. So keep and expand international production networks in manufacturing, still they can do that by using IT and CT. And also take advantage of dynamism of the digital economy, particularly with the CT. And for IT, think of its application. Don't be afraid of uh, approaching that. Uh, for CT, uh, series of policies for the flow of data and data-related businesses uh, must be prepared. And the focus of uh, economic integration will shift to more consumer-oriented, people-oriented approaches. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Professor Kimura. Uh, so let's keep this interactive, and I'm going to see if there are any questions from the floor. Yeah, Stephanie. Do we have a microphone? Uh, thank you very much, um, Stephanie Honey. Uh, so thank you, Professor Kimura. That was really fantastic, interesting, nuanced look at global value chains. Um, towards the end, you talked a little bit about the role of free trade agreements to facilitate those, those global or production networks. Uh, I wondered if you had done any work looking at the implications of the existing FTAs on that picture that you've painted of what's happening in, in East Asia. And in particular, um, I guess I'm channeling some of the, the colleagues in the room who have spent large chunks of their lives working on TPP and CPTPP. Are you anticipating much of an impact from that agreement? Because of course, one of the sort of philosophical underpinnings of that was to create the right enabling environment for global value chains. But um, I, are we going to see the sort of irresistible pull of the, the you know, CPTPP zone changing some of those existing global value chains in the region. Thanks. I, th I think uh, uh, the so-called high quality uh, FTAs uh, have uh, made a big, big help for so having particularly the second unbundling. Uh, say that we should have uh, the wide range of uh, commodities with our tariffs and also various kinds of trade facilitation, removal of non-tariff barriers. Uh, those are really essential portion for supporting the second unbundling. Uh, then services, uh, particularly the business-related services, B2B, uh, so that, that portion worked uh, pretty strongly to support uh, uh, second unbundling too. But coming into the third unbundling was the digital economy world. Uh, we have to do a little bit more seriously for B2C, or sometimes with C to C services. Uh, so the services liberalization was very slow, uh, particularly for those kind of aspects. Uh, and also data issues are g going to be much more important. Uh, those are not really incorporated in fully, fully in, in a sort of FTAs so far. Uh, yeah, right. Uh, but uh, to, to, yeah, we have to make a sort of assessment over there, but uh, the, a sort of text of uh, CPTPP on the e-commerce chapter uh, may be uh, too abstract to do that, how we can implement those kind of things. Uh, that, that's uh, what we should think of that much seriously. And also uh, SPS, uh, again, uh, this is a very slow in uh, improving that, uh, but when we think of uh, the variety of uh, consumption uh, in order to support, say, urban amenities and others, so that those are going to be much more important in the third unbundling stage. So, so the, uh, up to the second unbundling, uh, we took care of that pretty well, I think, uh, but the third unbundling, may, we have to do much more for the consumer-oriented, uh, people-oriented approach uh, in order to utilize a sort of digital technology effect effectively. So, so we are not doing uh, in a wrong direction, I think, uh, but we have to dig into that, so particularly for the individual level uh, liberalization. Any other questions from the floor? Yep, there's one by Rob. Rob. Yeah, thank you very much, Rob Scully, for a um, for a very informative and very comprehensive presentation and you, if you've um, opened our eyes to some of the issues involved for countries that are wanting to secure their places within these global value chains, I guess one of the other policy preoccupations that governments will have is how can they increase or maximise the share of the, of the value created within the value chains and um, I wonder whether you might say anything, might say a little bit about what uh, the policy strategies would be to increase or maximise mm -hmm. the country's share of the value being created in these value chains. And that's obviously not only for developing countries, but even for a country like New Zealand, that's an important issue. Uh, certainly, uh, say, if uh, our countries are shifting from just 100% import, 100% export to forming industrial agglomeration, 
then the domestic value added ratio could increase, of course. So, so that, that is uh, what many countries would like to do. Uh, but at the same time, uh, these days, I say, domestic value added ratio is uh, so popular for, so, um, among policy makers. Sometimes that's very dangerous uh, because, uh, say, once we have a connection with outside, uh, then that ratio is coming down, right? It should be coming down. Uh, but if they like to increase a domestic value added ratio, then actually it's an old type of uh, import substitution policy it may work like that. So, so they should not go back to that old regime, uh, but uh, so they have to connect to the world, but at the same time forming industrial agglomeration to make a sort of thickness in the industrial structure. Uh, that's what we have to do that. So, so just looking at the domestic value added ratio, uh, I think it's very misleading sometimes directly jump into that. So, so th that's, uh, we really have to uh, be careful. Wh what we, are, we really need is uh, the amount of value added rather than value added ratio. So uh, we, uh, yeah, in, in my experience uh, com uh, with a conversation with uh, policy makers, I think we really have to emphasize that in, in a sense. So, so but, but it's true that uh, once we have industrial agglomeration, then domestic value the ratio go, should go up, of course. But that may not be a sort of very smart policy target to do that. Any other questions? Okay, so I, oh, there we go. Thank you, um, Professor Kim, Kim, Kimura, for that presentation. Um, I was really in, uh, my name is Alicia Bagastrom from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade. I was interested in your point about the fear of reshoring um, due to automation, and we heard that this morning as well in Professor Baldwin's presentation. Um, but you said that uniquely in East Asia, um, you found that industrial robots seem to enhance network trade, but that this was unique and not seen in other regions. Um, might you have any insights as to some of the settings or some of the processes within East Asia that uh, made that unique? Thanks. Yeah, we have, to, we have to dig into the data much more carefully, actually. But uh, one possibility is that actually the introduction of industrial robots uh, is uh, highly biased in the rest of the world uh, toward automobile industry. And other industry is not really doing that. But in case of East Asia, the introduction is uh, really uh, distributed across uh, subsectors, particularly, say, uh, electronics and others. That, that is probably affecting uh, the, the results of uh, regressions. But I have to see that much more carefully. Uh, but in terms of uh, the, the degree of development in uh, inter international production networks, actually, this, this region is really doing a very good job, actually, compared with other parts of the world. So certainly, uh, in the extension of our study, uh, say we have to uh, extract, uh, say, uh, Europe portion only, uh, or uh, Mexico's portion, and then check uh, what's going on, definitely. But uh, probably, uh, we, we have a, a much more variety of industries are doing this kind of uh, a division of labor in East Asia. That is affecting a, a sort of a results. That's my guess, but I have to check that a little bit more in, de in detail. Anyone else? Okay, so I will abuse my role as chair and ask one last question, if that's okay. Uh, so some countries like China have had huge success in slotting into global value chains, but other countries like India, Indonesia haven't. And I know that at least in India, there is an interest to slot into these GVCs because there's a large labor force waiting to be employed. So what do you think they're not doing right? Or what do you think China did? Uh, you're quite right. A so sort of contrast is very sharp. So some countries are doing that, some are not doing at all, actually. India is not really successfully coming into that. I, I think one big reason is uh, the, the service link cost. Uh, say, uh, the port facilities and the infra hard infrastructure to connect between production block and production block. Still, the cost is uh, pretty high in case of India. That's one thing. Uh, the other could be a sort of location advantages. So in, in, in order to operate a factory, uh, say they, they can really utilize a sort of strength, say that the abundant labor 
uh, to do that. But, but just, just, uh, just having labor is not enough to operate uh, production block. They, they need uh, other conditions, uh, uh, other inputs, and th those kind of things. Uh, we really have to check uh, sort of investment climate in doing that too. So, so it's compared with Thailand. In Thailand, uh, now uh, wages are coming up to some extent, but still many companies feel that uh, say investment climate is much, much easier than other countries, including, say, Indonesia and others, uh, let alone uh, so India, actually. So, so the both are important. One, one is the service link cost. Uh, the other is the location advantages. I think that's a sort of checklist that uh, why uh, country, countries cannot really come into that. Okay. Well, please join me in thanking Professor Kimura for this session. Um, and we would like to appreciate and thank North Asia Cape for funding Professor Kimura's visit um, to Auckland. And so with that, I believe we are ready for lunch. <laughs>